Welcome to the Labyrinth Podcast. Thousand of students, less than a hundred labs. How do you find your way around the maze of research opportunities? We are UBC Psychi, and this podcast serves as a one-way route to everything you need to hear about UBC Psychology Labs. We invite principal investigators and lab members to encourage, educate, and inform students about research opportunities in psychology. Hello everyone, my name is Sahib and I'm an executive coordinator at, U- at Psychi, the International Honor Society in Psychology. Today on the Labyrinth podcast, we have the principal investigator from the Culture and Self Lab, Dr. Stephen Hine. Thank you so much for being here today, Dr. Hine. Well, thanks a lot, Sahib, for having me. Looking forward to talking with you. Yeah, I must say that I'm also really excited to talk to you as well. Uh, and just for the people listening, uh, can you introduce yourself and your position at UBC? Sure. Um, my name's um, Stephen Heine, and I'm a, a professor of cultural and social psychology uh, here at UBC, uh, where I've been for quite a while. I actually did my PhD here at UBC many years ago and um, worked at some other places in Japan and in the U.S., and then I've been back here for more than 20 years now. Oh, that is brilliant. Uh, we do have a UBC alumni with us then. Uh, so, Dr. Hein, uh can you please explain in one or two quite in one or two sentences, uh, or for, for anyone who's listening, what is the culture and self lab? Sure. So that's the name that I've uh, given my lab, and because it largely captures uh, what we study. So one thing that I'm interested in is how people's cultural experiences shape them, like the the norms uh, um, that we learn around us, how they shape how we think, and then I'm also interested in the self concept that is the psychological system that through we, that we have, which we interact with our worlds with. And most of the research in my lab relates to either of these topics, but you know, we're a, a big group of people and I have a lot of different interests. So we continue to study things and some of those aren't related to either culture or self. So the, the name of the lab is perhaps sometimes misleading. Uh, I see, I see the lab. Uh, I do understand that you have uh, from my understanding, you have different three different types of uh, criteria or categories in your lab, such as cultural psychology, meaning, maintenance, and genetic essentialism. Uh, do you mind mm-hmm. explaining what the difference between uh, all three of those? Sure. Um, so uh, um, my work in cultural psychology is looking at how um, uh, people's ways of thinking vary across different cultural contexts. That's generally what I've been looking at with that. Um, our meaning maintenance work um, sort of follows from uh, an idea that, that people have a need to uh, maintain a sense of meaning in their lives. And we have this psychological defense system that is geared to protect these meanings that we have. And often the world challenges the, our understandings of ourselves and our understandings of our worlds and that, that we re- respond to defend um, these uh, belief systems um, that we have. That's what that research is about. And um, genetic essentialism, uh, what we've been exploring with that is the idea that people have these intuitions about what, how the natural world uh, emerges from the result of some hidden underlying forces, which philosophers called essences. And, and people's understandings of genetics overlaps a lot with these innate intuitions that we have. So when people learn that genes are involved in something. So for instance, the idea that there are genes that relate to depression risk, that when people hear that, they become more deterministic in how they think about depression. It changes how they think about depression. They think it's something that, um, you know, if if you get depressed, it's because of your genes and you're always gonna have those genes. So uh, you're always gonna be vulnerable. And, and, And that generally is just not accurate for almost all, um, uh, traits, genes influence them, but not at all in the deterministic way that um, most people think. Mm-hmm. So it's more of a rather a mixture of nature and nurture rather than just one or the other. Yeah, yeah. And individual genes in particular are very, very weakly linked to any psychological phenomena. But, you know, people will get tested by 23andMe and they'll find out they have a variant that's linked to something that some researchers might have labeled the depression gene. Um, 
And really this is gonna explain, you know, a fraction of 1% of the variance in depression risk. It's the tiniest uh, um, amount of variance that's explained, but people's psychological reaction to it in contrast is very big. To learn that you have a depression gene has a very big psychological impact on people. <laughs> yeah, oh no, that is, uh, wow, that's uh, pretty fascinating. It, it reminds me of a quote uh, that uh, I, 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 I got from a literature course that I took last term, uh, Romance Studies. Um, so the quote was, uh, it's funny that people think how it's either nature or nurture, but rather that it is, uh, it's nature that can also nurture. And uh, yeah, but uh, yeah. on the topic of that, uh, I'm sorry, can you continue? No, I was just, I liked your quote. That's all I was. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. On the topic of, uh, uh, on topic of your lab from culture and self lab, uh, the self portion of your lab, uh, is it is it linked or modified off the concept of the self uh, and analytical psychology that was proposed uh, by Carl Jung? Um, no, I would say it's it's not that um, uh, Carl Jung hasn't had as much influence in the field of social psychology, where where a lot of research on the self concept happens, and and sort of influenced my own kind of research on this, um, and. Really, when I talk about a self-concept, I'm referring to the, the psychological lens um, by which we perceive our worlds. And it's, it sort of organizes our understanding of ourselves. Um, it includes our autobiography that we have, like our story that we tell about who we are and where we came from. Um, and it shapes the kinds of relationships we have with others. It shapes our motivations. It shapes our emotions. It shapes what we derive meaning from. So it, it really is this lens that we see the world through. And um, yeah, so, so Carl, Carl Jung, um, his tradition, uh, yeah, hasn't really um, shaped the social psychological work on the self-concept all that much. Um, it had more impact, I think, in, in personality, especially when talking about ideas related to introversion and extroversion. Oh, I see, I see. Uh, and uh, on the topic of, I think you also mentioned that meaning maintenance, it's about the, about people trying to have more of like self, uh, self, uh, I guess, defense mechanisms to make sense of their life. Uh, would you state yeah. that is related to personality psychology in any way? Um, so somewhat, somewhat, I, I personally, I think meaning is connected to almost everything in, in psychology. I have a very broad uh, conception of it. Um, but yes, it's meaning is talked about in the personality literature. There's some kinds of meaning relate to a sense of meaning in one's life. That's, that's one kind of meaning. There's many other kinds of meanings too. Um, and, and that's a, a big tradition uh, right now in uh, personality psychology is, you know, what predicts uh, a meaningful life. And that's, yeah, one of the related topics that I've been studying too. Uh, I see, I see. Uh... Okay, uh, and uh, you know, so since you are mostly involved in cultural psychology, uh, I wanted to know how did you, how did you get interested in it, and how did you decide that this is what you wanted to pursue? Yeah, um, so uh, I was I've always been fascinated by people from um, from other cultures. I, I've um, and I'm not sure how I originally uh, got that fascination, but it's always been there throughout my life, and um, and so. Uh, while I was studying psychology uh, as an undergrad, um, uh, I had to uh, take a language course for, for my degree, and I took Japanese because I I've always found Japan kind of fascinating, and um, and that got me really interested in in Japanese psychology. Although there uh, uh, really weren't any cross cultural psychology classes um, at the University of Alberta where I, I got my undergrad many years back. Um, uh, but I had the chance to go to Japan right after I graduated. I, I went uh, to teach English for a couple years in um, a junior high school in a very small town in southern Japan called Obama, of all things. And um, while I was living in Obama, um, I was just very struck by how, um, you know, my, my new friends and neighbors that um, I, I was living and working with, that how the way they seemed to be acting was very much at odds with all the stuff that I had learned in my psychology classes. And I was just fascinated by why we have these theories that explain, you know, how people should think. And we have all these clever experiments that demonstrate it. 
and um, and realizing that those really don't capture the experiences of well my Japanese friends and as I've learned and from other things too large swaths of the of the world's population that our, our theories are very much culture bound and so while living in Japan and then I thought ah this is what I want to do I decided I wanted to go to grad school and I wanted to study um, cultural psychology and that led to the career that I've had. Uh, that, that's amazing uh, the city of Bama. Um, uh, <laughs> Uh, so did you also do your master's uh, at UBC as well? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I did my master's and in, in PhD um, here at UBC. And uh, yeah, I was doing it very specifically at the beginning, really comparing um, Japanese and Canadians on, on various motivations, especially motivations regarding self-esteem, um, finding that, you know, Westerners uh, have a, a, a very strong desire to, to maintain a sense of self-esteem, and that doesn't seem to be uh, nearly as strong a motivation in Japan. And in contrast, there seems to be more of a motivation to maintain a sense of face, and um, which requires a, a very different set of uh, psychological mechanisms to, uh, to protect one's face compared with to protect one's self-esteem. So when you say uh, protect one's face, you mean like as in their family, their uh, the people that surround them, or is it more of or yeah? So, that's what it is. Well, so uh, face is something something like reputation. Uh, it's it's at least the, um, uh, the the amount of sort of social value that that others grant you based on your role that you have in society and and whether you're um, meeting people's expectations for that role but it can generalize beyond the individual because it can reflect on your whole family's face as, as you're suggesting here. And it can reflect on you know, your, your company's face or your country's face so that, that, that it can be shared. But it's very much a, a public representation, right? It's what other people are thinking about you or at least what you think other people are thinking about you. Um, and that's quite different from self-esteem which is really based on how an individual is evaluating themselves. And um, there's lots of psychological defense tactics that people can employ to protect their self-esteem. Like you can sort of, you know, focus the, you know, your own attention on, on your successes and not on your failures. And, you know, we can sort of remember things uh, that present us in a more positive light. Um, but that doesn't work for protecting face because um, what matters for your face is what other people are thinking about you. So, um, these self-protective strategies we have, they don't work on other people's heads. They only work on our own head. Oh, yeah. and that's a heavy one. Uh, but I feel like I can also relate to it being from, uh, being from an Asian background, that mm -hmm. you, have, you have a certain reputation that you have to maintain, not, not for yourself, but for your family. So if you're in the school, you, you try to be the best student possible. So not for yourself, but for your family, you know? And right. yeah, it's, uh, it's a lot different than uh, Western society where let's say I go to UBC now so I'm trying to I'm, I'm doing my education for myself rather than for my family. Interesting and and um, and where are you from? Uh, I'm from India. Okay great and, and what part of India? Uh, it's uh, it's a city called Chandigarh it's uh, near Punjab north oh. in India. All right yeah, yeah and yeah and so uh, it's interesting that's how you got into cultural psychology uh, Japan uh, but uh, now in your lab, is it mainly focused on Japanese, uh, Japanese versus Western uh, ideologies, or is there more to it, or, or are you just trying to uh, take into different levels of generality into context here? So also, uh, I don't know, let's say European countries, uh, European citizens as well. Yeah. Well. Um, most of my cross cultural research has looked at Japan because I have the you know, the, the, the most expertise in there. And I have a lot of collaborators um, in Japan that I can work with. And, and actually it's things like that that often guide um, the research questions that, that we follow. I have done some other ones. I have done um, uh, uh, some studies in, in India and Hong Kong um, and a few European countries um, and in Chile and Mexico. But um, yeah, m most of my uh, work has focused on Japan, and Japan actually is a, a convenient contrast in many ways because it's also a very uh, wealthy and you know uh, complex uh, society. And um, university students are 
you know, comparable levels of, of wealth um, in many ways, but there's still some really striking um, differences, especially in the nature of the self concept, um, which makes a, a great uh, contrast for, for studying. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, and uh, so uh, for the research students, uh, undergrad research students, uh, does your lab take in uh, undergrad students or is it just a uh, master's and uh, postgrad? Yeah, um, no, we, we definitely uh, uh, take a, a lot of undergrad research assistants in. Um, in describing how we do this, I should just note that uh, there's a big difference between the typical year and the current year with COVID. Um, has really uh, affected the daily runnings of the lab because um, normally we're, you know, uh, a lot of people who, who work closely together and we're often running studies where you have to interact with other people and we haven't been able to do any of that. Um, so this year our, our lab is just a, a shell of its uh, typical, um, uh, the way it typically runs. So I'll talk more about how we do things in general rather than than this year. But in, in normal years, um, we have uh, about 30 to 40 undergrads who are um, working in the lab. It's, it's, it's a pretty big lab. Um, I work with, I think it's five uh, grad students and yeah, about 30 to 40 undergrads. And of those undergrads, um, maybe in a typical year, around eight of them or so are uh, directed studies or honors students. And the directed studies and honors students, um, uh, they typically work on a single project over a whole year. And uh, in the end, they, they write up a final paper about this project. And um, they work very closely with a grad student. All, all the undergrads work, work very closely with, with uh, my grad students. And um, we have a, a bi-weekly lab meeting that the grad students and the directed studies and honors students uh, attend. Um, and uh, also the, the, the direct studies honor students meet very frequently with the grad students. And then, um, and we have um, ad hoc meetings with myself, the grad student and the directed studies and honor students. Um, the majority of the undergrad research assistants in my lab though are um, our volunteer research assistants um, who uh, are working with, um, grad students on, on various projects that most, because most of these projects involve, well, just a, a, a lot of labor involving a, a, a lot of people. Um, uh, and those who um, uh, stick around for more than a year are the ones who would typically become the directed studies and, and honors student. Um, and uh, yeah, so that, that's typically the way people would start off in my lab as a, as a volunteer research assistant. And then in a following year, um, um, become a, a directed studies or a uh, honor student. Oh, so, so your lab's like one of the more bigger psychology labs, uh, 30 to 40 undergraduate students. But yeah, it, it can be very big on, on yeah, because we have a lot of different projects. Each of my grad students is working on a number of different projects. Um, and some of these projects can involve a, a, a lot of, yeah, uh, labor. Oh, of course. Uh, so what kind of labor or duties are we looking at here? Yeah, well, um, the uh, undergrads would, a big part of um, many of their responsibilities are when we are running participants in an in-lab study. Uh, and so we, we do run a, a lot of in-person behavioral studies, not this year, sadly, but in, in typical years. And so a lot of the work is just with um, you know interacting with the uh, with the participants, uh, the research participants in the lab, sort of e explaining the study. Sometimes there's a script to follow. Um, sometimes there's other you know confederates involved in in, in a study. So that's where a, a lot of the work is. Um, also, then there'll be work in um, uh, processing the data. So some of the data will need to be coded. Like we might have. Um, some open-ended responses that needs to be coded into a category um, and or, or data might need to be um, entered into a computer or um, uh, or, or just while well, helping the um, the grad students in the, the designing of the study uh, or in writing up ethic ethics applications 
and um, and the grad students will usually teach them how to run some simple kinds of analyses of, of the data. Um, and it varies a lot, I should say, just by the particular grad student that that one is working closely with that that they're each individuals and have you know their their own ways of um, delegating the tasks and they're all working on different kinds of projects. So people's experiences vary, vary a lot from person to person. Hmm. I see. Uh, so since you have so many different projects, uh, do like the students get to pick which project they want to work on? Well, so uh, the way people um, get into my lab is that uh, everyone applies to uh, my lab manager. So my, my lab manager, who's right now, his name is uh, Nick Kay, and um, he's sort of the human resource officer, I guess, in, in, in the lab. And um, so, uh, so people apply to him and then he uh, sends the application to um, the different grad students in my lab because it's um, at different times, you know, uh, different students, different grad students have, um, depending on where they are in their projects, they might all of a sudden need a lot of new people or they might not, um, might not be needing any at that time. And so usually how it starts, you would start working on a um, project that the grad student is working on and, and who selects you for it. And then after you've been there a while and you then learn more about what else is happening in the lab, that's uh, people then can often then have more choice and choosing a, pro an, uh, a different project to go uh, work on after they've been working for a while with the grad students. Uh, I see, I see. Uh, and uh, so I'm assuming your lab is extremely busy, uh, but during uh, the pandemic, COVID, uh, how did you guys uh, adapt to, I mean, of course, it's not the same as it was before or generally, but how yeah. did you adapt to the whole pandemic? Yeah, well, one, it, things have slowed down. Um, and we have, we have far fewer actually undergrads in, involved in the lab this year. What's especially slowed down is we're not doing any in-person studies. And those are the ones that typically um, involve the most work with, with undergrads. So the studies that we still are running, we, we still run um, several studies on online platforms, such as um, Amazon has something called Mechanical Turk, where um, people sign up and they do studies for um, a small amount of pay. And so these days, all of the studies that we're running right now, I think, are all of these online uh, studies. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's, we've, it's, it's yeah, it's, it's too bad that we've had to cut back. We, we had some, you know, big in-person projects that we just had to halt, you know, for a whole year, well, at least a year. And we'll, we'll see how much how much longer, um, and that's yeah. It's been it's been very disruptive. Um, it's been really stressful on everybody. Sadly, stressful on the grad students, stressful on the undergrads. It's uh, yeah. It's 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 been a, a tough time, and I'm very happy that UBC is returning to in person um, classes, and I'm, I imagine we'll be able to restart our in person studies again in the fall. Yes, I I I just read that email yesterday that. We're returning to in person in September. Yeah, but of course there will be limitations around that as well. Probably still, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and um, so I I really wanted to I, I I don't know how I should phrase it, but what is your labs? What is your culture labs culture? I mean, uh, uh, you know, generally there's when you go into a workplace, there's people of different personalities, different attitudes, and how do they all mingle together? Or, or what kind of activities do you do? Uh, besides, like obviously volunteering and working. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a, um, that's a great question. I would say um, there's sort of two levels of the culture. I think each, because each grad student is sort of running their own mini lab. Um, all the students that they are working with. So each grad student has their kind of own individual lab culture of how they're working with the undergrads on the more daily basis. Um, and then, um, uh, yeah, we have like this, this bi-weekly meeting with the directed studies and, and, and the grad students. And uh, when there's not a pandemic, we usually have a, um, uh, but one social event per term, um, usually either at, at my place, I have a party or, or we'll go to say Kerner's pub. Um, and, uh, and then I know the, um, my grad students also have some 
individual events with um, with, with their undergrads in it, but it varies a lot um, from grad student to grad student. Hmm. No, that is definitely interesting. And uh, uh, I, I, so I want to understand uh, your involvement, uh, I guess your day-to-day -day responsibilities uh, as, a, as a principal investigator in the lab. So do you interact with undergrad students uh, and you know, just how does it work? Yeah, so um, I get to know the directed studies and honors students um, quite well because we have our, our biweekly lab meetings and also um, we'll have the occasional ad hoc meeting where um, I meet with the directed study student, the grad and the grad student and myself, where we'll, that's where we'll usually do more of the planning for an individual study when we're at a point where we, you know, need to make changes or, or, or want to start something new, then we'll talk about it there. Um, but, and that's large, so that's largely my interactions with the, um, uh, with, with the undergrads is, is, with with the directed studies, I sadly don't get to meet as much with the um, uh, the the research assistants. Um, I, I they will usually come to um, uh, when I have a, a party at my house. Um, they will usually come to that. But that's um, uh, yeah. So I it's the directed study student who I get to meet a lot with, and and not so much the um, undergrad volunteers who are working closely with the um, the grad students. And um, so I kind of work through them indirectly. And then how I spend my day, the kind of responsibilities I have in overseeing everything means um, I have a lot of meetings with, with students and with other collaborators. And um, uh, um, we have, have a lot of meetings where we you know, discuss the research, just discuss what we're gonna do. And then I spend my days um, doing a lot of reading and writing and, uh, and teaching. And that's, that's largely how uh, my, my time is spent. Um, and, and the grad students, do similar things like a grad student operates a lot like a, a junior faculty member that they, they don't do teach instead of doing teaching they're taking some courses um, uh, and, and doing some teaching assistant grading and stuff but other than that they're doing very similar work where they are you know creating studies doing a lot of reading doing a lot of writing and they do a lot of analyses of data um, yeah so that's that's how how we fill our fill our days well yeah it, it seems really uh busy and hectic but i the most important part i think during the whole thing was you have parties at your home for the whole lab <laughs> yeah usually usually once at once a year we'll be at my place and uh the other time we'll have with the directed study student just on, at kerner's once a year as well oh, that's, that's brilliant uh, I didn't. I didn't think many labs do that, but that's really good to hear. Uh, and so, uh, just for like the students listening, uh, what is the best way to like apply for your lab? Are there any standard procedures, or what's the best hiring period? Yeah. So, um, uh, I, I usually have some signs around the department, which of course no one's in the department now, um, uh, which have my, um, which has a little, well, then. Uh, you peel a um, piece of paper off and it has like the email address of my lab manager, which I can just tell you it. It's, um, it's mech labs, M-E-C-C-L-A-B-S, M-E-C-C-L-A-B-S at psych.ubc.ca. And that goes to my lab manager, who's currently um, Nick Kay. Um, and he's actually, yeah, so this mech labs just, um, my culture and self lab is one of four labs that we share all of our um, space and, and our equipment um, between four uh, PIs, um, Aaron, Oren, Zion, Kristen, Lauren, Mark Schaller, and, and myself. And, um, and so the lab manager, Nick, he is the, uh, he's like the human resource officer there. And he will forward everyone's application to the grad students. Sadly, right now during the pandemic, we just, like our, our lab is quite full with not many people this year because there's just not that much um, uh, going on, but it will pick up again in the fall. And usually the best time to apply to the lab, I would say is late summer, like August or right at the beginning of the school year when it starts in September. And in general, earlier is better because the, the lab does fill up. And usually it's like in September where we're getting all the, the new projects started. 
So we don't have as many new projects starting at other times of the year. And so that's especially when uh, we, we are looking for people. And I believe that's probably quite true of most of the other labs in the department too. That um, generally, especially when we're running studies with you know, UBC students, um, then yeah, we are kind of starting new projects with new directed study students, new honors students um, in the fall. And so, yeah, so if you contact my lab manager late in the summer, late like in August, um, or yeah, just as soon as the school term has started, that's, that's the best time. That's the best time, I see, uh, late August. Uh, and uh, also, are there any, um, I wouldn't say, I would say preferences, are there any preferences for like what kind of GPA, what kind of GPA you're looking for or uh, year level for the students? Yeah, so um, since uh, um, Nick Kay, the, the, the lab manager, he directs uh, all the applications to the grad students, they all have kind of their own individual preferences. In general, having a better GPA will, will make you more, more attractive um, to them. Um, with regarding the year, um, I think it's like all years are fine because uh, I know some of my grad students really like taking on a new young student, like a first or second year student, with the idea that if um, they enjoy working there and they're doing a good job, then they would stay for their whole degree. And by the uh, time they graduate, they would be sort of, you know, have, have mastered all of the skills involved with the project. Um, but they also are also interested in taking on more, more senior students who, you know, have more, um, uh, training in, the, in their psychology courses. Um, and uh, yeah, and I, I think generally, you know, um, looking especially for students who are, you know, curious and responsible. So, I mean, a, a lot of just the lab duty work is, you know, being there on time, especially if you're running participants, you know, that's, um, it's really important that they, uh, the research assistants are, are there when the, the you know, the participants show up for the study. Um, so um, yeah, it's, you know, just being responsible with, with uh, good time management, but yeah, generally, you know, curious and thoughtful, interested in, 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 you know, being involved in research and um, just able to carve out some time. I think our typical RAs are usually working around six to eight hours a week, something like that. Um, and so being able to carve out that amount of time and, and it's usually time during the day like we don't have i mean there, there's some tasks that people might do at home things like coding um that they might do that at home after after hours but but since a lot of the time is spent running student participants then it's largely you know between nine and five that uh, most of those studies are happening so so to be able to have some uh time available during the day and it's usually very flexible that, you know, we, we work around the student schedule. Like, so if a student's only available Tuesday afternoons, then um, we arrange it such that uh, we'll be running, collecting data from participants with them on Tuesday afternoon. So usually we have quite a bit of flexibility to work around um, the student schedules. Yeah, uh, that, that's brilliant because uh, I think, you know, looking for, uh, looking for people who are curious and uh, want to improve themselves, but are also committed, committed and responsible with their uh, responsible with their tasks is uh, is crucial, and that's what generally all that's what generally all researchers should be like. And, yeah, yeah, and I also really like the fact that it's flexible. Uh, yeah, you know. and, and it's worth highlighting one other point about the flexibility is that again, because much of the time is spent running student participants, well, the um, the human subject pool that that it really um, the uh, it dies down a lot during midterm weeks because all the student participants are busy with their midterms, and that conveniently is when our research assistants are busy with their midterms. So it usually works out that at your busier times are also the um, the times when there's going to be less of these experiments happening because the, the participants themselves are going to be too busy to be signing up for studies then. Oh yeah, I, I actually never thought about it, but yeah, that's that seems that yeah that makes perfect sense. Uh, <laughs> but also, I I think you have mentioned a lot of the volunteer opportunities, but also, are there any uh, paid opportunities at your lab? 
So sadly, the only paid position in my lab is the the lab manager, who's who's Nick. Um, uh, and yeah, so the uh, the the rest of it, we're we're doing it as kind of as an internship where yeah, the students gain a a, a a lot of experience. And and sadly, we I, I don't have the uh, like we're we're limited. Um, research is ex expensive, and we're limited with with the I, I get grants to do it, but the grants um, only can go so far. So we are quite dependent on um, yeah on offering training opportunities to the students, and and that's primarily what they get is training, and they also get um, by getting to know faculty members and the grad students closer that also we can provide them with uh, letters of, of reference later, which um, is very helpful for um, getting into other graduate programs or um, uh, various other kinds of jobs. And I do think this research experience that students can get is uh, one of the more valuable kinds of experience they, they get in a psych degree, like this hands-on experience of, of how to do research. Those skills generalize to a lot of other kinds of skills that, that you might need in other jobs that you have in your life. So I think it's 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 really valuable kinds of experiences that you can get um, volunteering in a lab. And that's not just my lab. I think that's just really any lab at UBC and, and especially in our department. I um, There's many, many opportunities there uh, for students. And I know it can be intimidating, you know, to to go and, and to ap apply for um, these labs. It can be intimidating to you know, approach your your instructor or or, or grad students, but it's uh, I, I encourage you to to try to do that. There's lots of signs up advertising for these positions uh, every year in the department, and they really are a valuable opportunity. And I I really encourage you to to pursue some of those. No, I definitely agree that uh, experience and connections they are extremely valuable to. Uh, just for your general life, you know, uh, to find any job, even if it's not related to psychology. Uh, just that experience, in my personal opinion, is that experience, uh, it counts so much, it counts for everything. Uh, anyways, I feel like we have, uh, we have, we have probably done like around 30 to 40 minutes. So uh, I want to say thank you so much for coming in today. And uh, I'm really happy that you were here today. And uh, this is our second episode. And Thank you so much for making the time and coming here to talk about your lab. Well, thanks so much for having me. It was great talking. Uh, yeah. And so with this, uh, this uh, includes our second, this concludes our second episode of Labyrinth Podcast. Uh, we want you to know that this podcast will be available on Spotify and YouTube uh, because we want this to be as accessible as possible. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, then please check the description below for more information on the lab. Uh, and if you're listening on Spotify, then make sure you follow us on YouTube and Instagram to stay up to date with everything UBC Psychi and the Labyrinth podcast. Thank you so much for the coming in today, Dr. Hein. Thank you.